Good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to see the car park full today. It's incredible what we've achieved in the last year. It's great to be back, and I'm thrilled to be able to give to you some highlights from the fantastic progress we've made over the last year alone. We launched the UK Food Valley last November to support the growth of our industry with major investments in production, skills, innovation, low carbon and technology. This year, investment inquiries have doubled with multiple businesses looking to expand here as a direct result of our UK Food Valley. Our leadership on automation led by the Lincoln Institute of Agritech team is now recognised as world leading world leading by government in both skills and in robotics. Since 2016, we have seen an incredible 70 million invested in new agri-food skills infrastructure, including Bishop Burton Showground Campus, the University of Lincoln's Rise Home Campus, the National Centre for Food Manufacturing in Holbeach, the Lincoln Institute of Technology, and more recently, the Centre for Food and Fresh Produce Logistics in Boston. The recent launch of the South Lincolnshire Food Enterprise Zone Hub has created a landmark development promoting collaboration for small or startup businesses in the food and drink sector, and we're delighted to say that the first tenants are moving in this month. We have also secured over 100 million of new partnership R&D projects with the food and farming industry, involving 200 partners and 110 innovation projects. Last year, the university announced its first two agri-tech spin-outs. Fruitcast, which uses AI and computer vision to forecast fruit crop harvest to manage marketing and reduce waste, and Agaricus Robots for Mushroom Harvesting. Shortly, we'll be welcoming Ben Willis from Fruitcast to tell us a little bit more about this. We have seen major investments in controlled environment agriculture, greenhouses, healthy food choices, especially in new plant proteins and in new cold stores. Some notable investments I'd like to share include Dyson's Fruit Farm that covers six hectares of greenhouses, the same as 10 Premier League football pitches, growing strawberries and is the most advanced fruit farm in the world. Global Berry now has four hectares of greenhouses and plans a further 32 hectares north of Lincoln. Princes have invested 84 million to upgrade and expand their site at Long Sutton. Plant and Bean's new factory in Boston is now Europe's largest plant protein factory. And Branston Potatoes' new factory and Naylor's Nutrition's new vegetable protein plant both are using waste or lower grade potatoes and vegetables respectively to extract plant protein for our food sector. And these are just a few examples of the investment and the innovation that our fabulous, and I mean fabulous, businesses in Greater Lincolnshire are making. In fish, fish, sorry, in fish farming and aquaculture, a rapidly emerging sector for us, a planning application has been submitted for a prawn farm in South Lincolnshire, with further projects in fin fish and prawns emerging. Our aim is to create a network of fish farms to change how we source our fish today. While so much positive activity is taking place, from influencing policies to attracting investors, driving innovation and finding new low-carbon solutions, we cannot avoid the impacts felt by the fuel and energy crisis. Notwithstanding the pressures on household domestic energy prices, these pressures are even more acute in our industry and indeed impact households further if we can't innovate and support our sector as much as possible in these difficult times. We need to keep producing food more efficiently. Our food chain, cold stores and greenhouses are all major energy users, but our new units are pioneering and use and the use of waste heat from AD plants, biomass heating, and we are beginning to develop geothermal energy for heating to start to support the development that is really urgently needed to make sure we're fit for the future. Our abundant renewable energy sector, as we heard about earlier, can help us transition from fossil fuels. 
with a wealth of offshore wind and Viking Link offering low carbon opportunities right here on our doorstep. In Spalding, a major new battery storage facility in the heart of our food processing and distribution cluster is now being developed. We are also working with the LEP Energy Council to ensure the local area energy plan connects food sector needs with energy innovations and we are working with partners to develop plans to decarbonise our food freight through the use of new renewable fuels, which we've heard about this morning. We recognise how much our food and farming industry is changing and needs to continue to change and adapt. COVID, the war in Ukraine, global warming concerns and post-Brexit impacts are all changing the way our food is produced, sourced and distributed. And we are determined that our UK Food Valley will deliver on what our industry requires and help lead to create a globally significant sector right here in the heart of Lincolnshire. This is possible. I'd now like to hand over to our amazing panel. I'm delighted. Oh, sorry, it's still me. <laughs> I'm delighted to be moving on to hear from some of our inspiring voices. So, first up is you, Ben. Ben was previously head of property and estates at Dyson Farming, launching 360 Rural, and has recently been responsible for project managing a new 15-acre glasshouse enterprise with Foodcast, an AI-enabled data yield forecasting businesses for soft, soft fruit and a spin-out from the University of Lincoln Carers Programme. Believe it or not, I had to narrow that down so it wasn't too long, because he's so incredible. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you very much, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, five minutes to talk about farming in a county that is all about farming. I am biased. I'm passionate about agriculture, and I'm passionate about agriculture in Lincolnshire. But farming is changing, and it's changing beyond all recognition, in my opinion, not just here in Lincolnshire, in the UK, but around the world. The volatility in the sector is enormous. The profitability in the sector is hugely variable, but historically, profitability has been very low, high risk, low return, lack of investment, lack of innovation. And we need innovation within that sector to increase productivity. I think it's a bit like being on a roller coaster, and I've said this to a number of people and a number of businesses I work very closely with. For some people, it's great to be on the roller coaster. They're strapped in, they're ready for what's coming, they're ready for the opportunity. But for others, they're not strapped in. They don't want to be on that roller coaster, and really, it is pretty tough out there. And we're very fortunate in Lincolnshire to have the support of organisations like LRSN, who are supporting many, many farming businesses who are really struggling at the moment with this volatility. But of course it's far beyond just what's happening in Lincolnshire. The impact of fuel, the impact on fertiliser, that's having a massive impact globally and a massive impact within the industry here. So as we think about that, some of the changes we've seen recently as we go towards net zero have been accelerated with everything that's gone on in the last 18 months. There's 96 different calculators to work out your carbon position within farming. We really just need one good one. But whichever one of those 96 you choose, it probably only gives four messages. Use less fuel. Use less fertilizer. Cultivate less. Sequest more carbon. That sounds really simple, but actually doing that at scale is somewhat of a challenge. So, we're here within Lincolnshire, we've got Precision Ag, we've got it around the world. There's loads of technology available out there, you can buy it off the shelf already, and there's much more being developed. But it costs, and how do we get businesses to be able to make enough money to reinvest? Variable rate seed applications as you go across a field. Variable rate fertiliser application as you go across a field. Now, variable rate spray. You can spray a brown weed in a green crop, and even now, you can buy off-the-shelf technology to spray a specific green weed in a green crop, hugely reducing the amount of inputs whilst maintaining outputs. That has to be the future. We've got so much technology within the sector, we just need to get it rolled out and used more. And that, in my opinion, is more about collaboration and making sure that individuals can work together. 
A little bit about precision farming in this short five minutes. Well, at Dyson, I was responsible for implementing 15 acres of glass houses. That was an amazing business to be involved with, and that project pulled together heat from renewable energy from AD, uh, that was a waste product, the electricity from the AD plant, capturing CO2, capturing water, an amazing project for Lincolnshire. And I think we will see much more of that kind of thing as we go forward. Remember, the food strategy wants more fruit and veg. A great position for Lincolnshire be in to produce more fruit and veg. Involved with Fruitcast through that, which was mentioned a little while ago, a spin-out of Lincoln University. This is really, really exciting for the county to take uh, a PhD piece of work that was then rolled out into the market to provide fruit forecasting, not just for strawberries, but beyond. Funded by Ceres, funded by Innovate UK as well, and now seeking VC funding. Hugely, hugely exciting, and there's lots, lots more to come on that. So watch the space with Fruitcast. But why is predicting yield within something like soft fruit important? Well, if we know what yield we've got coming, we can predict labour. If we know what, what fruit we've got coming, we can control the market more. If I give you just one statistic, the price of strawberries in June is £3 a kilo. The price in March is £12 a kilo. If you can move the, the, the sort of production just a week or two, it makes a massive impact within the business. The UK Food Valley, I mean, we've got amazing things happening in Lincolnshire. And we've got huge opportunity. Look at those three key strategic aims. Accelerating food chain automation. It's happening here. Um, delivering low carbon food chains. It's happening here. And then delivering the market potential for more healthy and nutritious food. Again, it's happening here. So I am hugely optimistic about the future of agricultural production, not just in the UK, but specifically Lincolnshire, because I am very, very biased as a yellow belly. I think we've got enormous potential, and we just need to get investment in it to drive it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Ben. We're now going to hear from Val Braybooks. Val is the Dean of the National Centre for Food Manufacturing, from where she leads the university's work to support the food manufacturing sector and is a key pillar of our UK Food Valley programme at the cutting edge of high-value employer-led skills. Val has been at the forefront of the successful Community Renewal Fund pilot with the Grimsby Seafood Cluster and the Boston Centre for Food and Fresh Produce Logistics. Welcome, Val. Well, thank you, Sarah Louise, and thank you all. It's, it's great to be here. Um, well, where do we start? I, I think, you know, leading from the front and leading the way, when we look at skills and, and agri-food skills in Greater Lincolnshire, I have to say, I do believe we do lead the way. And when I say we, I use the term partnerships because we are a successful partnership of many partners, including the LEP, our colleges, our Institute of Technology, who have all work together, obviously with the university, to actually cement what is a very, very uh, strong uh, nationally leading skill structure for the agriculture and food sectors. And obviously the challenges that we've spoken about today, the, the cost challenges, the carbon challenges, the automation challenges that the industry is facing, must also be accompanied by a parallel offer of higher level skills and we as partners in the university have been working very hard to, to address that and cement the, the skills path offering particularly at higher levels and obviously David was alluding to the 175,000 technicians needed and you know the food industry has acute shortages we're going to need 11,000 new jobs here in the food sector by 2030 and 50% of those will need higher level skills at level four and five and above. And obviously, we've been talking about the, the cluster, the, the, um, the free port and other areas that are growing, which too have, have um, demands for higher level skills. So as an area, higher level skills are really important to us. And I think this is where we should really celebrate the, the UK Food Valley. Um, it gives us the strategic united thread that enables us to create a world-class food sector that we can promote and draw on and draw talent into our businesses and have young people queuing up at the doors to, to work and develop their careers with our back of us and our, and our youngs and the great businesses that are here. 
Um, and like they would have historically looked to, to you know, the, the great automotive Land Rover Jaguar for their careers, our careers will have such status and the UK Food Valley is really helping us drive that reputation and it's great to be there. Um, but we can't obviously underestimate the challenge, but we should have confidence. We have got the most wonderful skills infrastructure here in Greater Lincolnshire. And Sarah Louise has spoken about that investment that has gone into the South Lincolnshire Food Enterprise Zone and the National Centre for Food Manufacturing, where £18 million uh, over the years has brought together and built a nationally leading and internationally uh, growing reputation for the National Centre for Food Manufacturing. And we've also enjoyed the, the investment in our other um, partner colleges that, that Sarah Louise mentioned and including the £15 million that went into helping our partner colleges in the Lincolnshire Institute of Technology gain investment in, in equipment that they could really um, lead the way in terms of some of the automation and or carbon technologies that we've been talking about. So as a, as a, a group of, of providers we are really well kitted out, we have all the expertise to move forward. Um, I think it's also important to, to just recognise that we also have gaps that we must fill and we've been talking about the, the area in Grimsby and the seafood se sector up there which hasn't ha had perhaps the level of support that perhaps the south of the county has had. So we're very pleased to be working with the Seafood Grimsby and Humber Alliance and our partners at the Grimsby Institute to develop new curriculum for the seafood processing sector. And, um, and that will have national implications because obviously, you know, national benefit for the seafood sector as a whole, not just within Grimsby. I think it's also important to see the work that we do with, with Karen and our colleagues at the LEP in terms of helping match the skills needs of inward investors, um, developing a service of skills and an offer for them. And that appeals to investors and there's great success in that. So we are linking up and tying up our, our skills offer to our investors with the help of the support. And obviously we've got expertise in developing curriculum, which we have this very comprehensive curriculum for the agri-food sector. And, you know, we also have to address the, the needs that, are, that we've talked about in terms of circular economy, sustainable developments in food and farming are all parts of the, the skills needs that we need to develop. We've also taken a, a number of initiatives that we're all working hard to make sure we, we fuel the talent, ta talent pipeline. Um, T-levels um, that are obviously developing in schools and launching now in colleges, I think are going to be the game changers for the industry because this can really fuel the talent pipeline of large numbers of young people coming through our colleges and schools and the T-level route uh, with the skills needed and the skills, knowledge and behaviours that we talked about already embedded in them. Uh, will be great and of course the uh, level of employer engagement in those developments are, are, will make sure that we do have our young people coming out with the skills that they need. I think the one thing that we do need to, to talk about and really celebrate is this link to innovation and skills. You can't talk about them differently and historically we have, we've had skills over here, universities over there and, and nothing knitting these things together and actually as providers of skills we've got to be aware of what's going to happen, what's coming around the corner in the next 5, 10, 15 years so that we're actually foresighting and looking to develop our curriculum and infrastructure to be able to deliver when these new technologies arrive and not be dragging around for 10 years later to catch up and I think you, we've got some great practice in Lincolnshire where through the university, the Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology ourselves and the Institute of Technology where we're actually working as a partner with the university to build that skills and innovation infrastructure. And that's also just, you know, really percolating into some of the projects that, that Sarah Louise mentioned. Our partnership with, with, with Boston Borough Council and the college um, in the delivery of the Centre for Food and Fresh Produce Logistics is helping those small businesses to develop the skills and innovation needs, the skills and, and uh, challenge, sorry, skills and innovation needs that they have. And also we have a, a, a sister project in Grimsby which is championed with North East Lincolnshire Council which is the Seafood Sector Support Programme which we've supported over 70 small businesses in Grimsby with their needs too and that's been everything from helping them sort of to identify a new species that's more sustainable to put on their fish vans or to build 
build new food factories. So it's everything. So between those projects, about £3.5 million pounds of, of innovation and skill support for our small businesses, which is absolutely crucial. And then I'd just finally like to, 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 to thank the LEP and to celebrate. We've been talking about electric vehicles uh, and carbon footprinting, and we've got a, a great project that is just starting called Enabling the Electrification of the Grimsby Fish Farm Fleet. Um, uh, really important, there's a hundred of those small vans run out of Grimsby every day. Neil will know, know the, the fine details of this, but they run out of Grimsby, sourcing their fish from Grimsby and then distributing this fish uh, to consumers across the country. Um, but there's no, no plan for electrification uh, for that sector, for those small independent trainers as such. So this, this project will help us build the you know, sustainable fish vans through, through electrification, looking at the carbon footprint and how we reduce that for these 100 or so small traders, which is you know, at the heart of, of Grimsby as well as the, the bigger business that Grimsby supports. So that's a great example and we're really looking forward to standing here in a year or two's time and, and reporting on the progress. So all I would like to say, the challenges are, are huge. Um, I think the thing that we have here is the collaboration that we have, the partnership is, is outstanding and I'd just like to say you know we've got a heck of an engine under this bonnet and the UK Food Valley has given us the direction of travel so thank you. Thank you ever so much for that, Val. I think anybody that knows Val knows there's only one problem, and it's that we need 10 of her, if not more, in Greater Lincolnshire, because she is incredible, and she absolutely delivers on what she says. So that brings us on nicely to a short clip, actually, by Regal Fish, talking about their experience working on a seafood pilot project and showcasing the energy benefits it's actually brought to their business. <laughs> At Regal we supply a range of fresh and frozen fish, primarily the fresh fish is what we're famous for but over the last sort of 10 or 12 years we've expanded um, the frozen range so locally produced Grimsby products, handmade bakes, gourmet items. We employ um, between 80 and 90, we are always expanding. We have 22 vehicles in our fleet and we deliver to 5,000 customers a week. About 70,000 customers uh, are registered with us at the moment. People are eating more fish because it's a healthier option. It's very versatile and we have a lot of nice products, you know, created here in Grimsby so they like the local thought of it. Simon Dwyer from the Fish Merchants Association, um, he introduced us uh, to the Community Renewal Fund. It was something that um, gave us an opportunity to think about our carbon footprint. Our customers are asking uh, for what our carbon footprint is of the products and the vehicles. So it provided a really good opportunity for us to be able to look at a project uh, with measuring that carbon footprint. So once we applied for the fund, Wayne Martindale from Lincoln University came in um, and he started working with us on um, gathering the data that he needed to make these measurements between the vehicles and obviously the lighting, everything that we're using here. Um, so that gave him everything he needed to be able to make those measurements. We had the solar panels, uh, we were a little bit ahead of the game with those, um, but he, he certainly then could go forward and look at what we were using um, and where we were using it too, whether it was between the cold store or in the factory. The electricity is used um, in the in the refrigeration. We have uh, three chillers in the cold store, which houses around 100 pallets, which is using obviously refrigeration. So that was the, the main source of our energy use. Wayne was able to, to see exactly where the usage was using the data, and the cold store was the main source of his findings. Based on the information that Wayne gave us, we know over the next year we are looking at replacing all of our lighting which is going to cause a significant reduction. The next stage we'll be looking at installing hopefully a heat pump which will take the heat from the chillers and it will put it back into the offices so there will be no need for us to use any radiators. From there it will be more solar panels so that this site will be completely free from energy from the grid. Because we're taking orders in advance, we know exactly what we need to prepare for a day. Any 
offcut is utilised. So it's either in a fish pie or bake, the tails are made into goujons, even the waste products, the skeletons, the heads, everything goes on to a local company who have those made up into fish meal um, so that it's all being utilised. We're almost a zero waste factory. It's important to Regal that we consider um, our, our footprint um, and we can relay this information to the customers. We don't want to um, look like we're being green and make claims without knowing that we've got the data um, and the proof that that is actually what is happening here. it's really nice to actually see what we're talking about coming into action and coming into delivery. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce our final expert of the day, Jonathan Oldfield. Jonathan is Head of Complex at Moy Park and has over 25 years of experience in our food industry and is involved in farming, feed milling, processing and supply chain activities predominantly in Lincolnshire. I'm very pleased to say he's also a member of our food board. Thank you for that, Jonathan. He started his career in the poultry industry and now heads up the Moy, Pike, Moy Park site in North Kesteven, one of the UK's top 15 food companies and one of Europe's leading poultry producers. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, some people may be aware of Moy Park, some less so, but uh, yeah, poultry production is, is probably what we're renowned for, uh, and we're one of the largest poultry producers uh, in Europe, supplying own label retail uh, products to both food service uh, markets and, and, and direct to stores. Um, however, we're not just about chicken. Uh, we also supply beef products, uh, vegetable protein, uh, and even the famous apple pies, uh, which are the hottest substance known to humankind. Um, Anik uh, Plant is where I'm based, uh, but we've got about 2,500 colleagues who work across Greater Lincolnshire uh, between the plant, our farms, uh, and our hatchery uh, in Newark. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, sustainability and what it means for us, and then also a little bit about uh, labour. Um, sustainability has always been uh, part of what Moy Park's about. Right from 1943, it's always been trying to be a, a sustainable premier provider. Um, and we've implemented policies and made commitments through the years uh, to, to actually back up that claim. Um, but most recently, and as part of our wider group commitment, we're part of the JBS group uh, internationally, uh, we've committed to become uh, net zero by 2040. Um, and we've had to adopt lots of different strategies uh, to head towards that goal. Um, first of all, investment in emissions reductions across the facilities, as we've just heard, things like heat recovery and storage, secondary use uh, of water uh, and waste heat um, from the process. Uh, we've invested heavily in research and development projects to exist, uh, assist ourselves, our own farms and our producers in terms of reducing their own carbon intensity. Uh, and the initial first stage is to get to a 30% uh, reduction in intensity against scope one and two uh, by 2030. Um, we're doing things like partnering with the University of Lincoln uh, and other uh, industries to look at the use of uh, energy reducing technology. One of the key things we've already heard, <laughs> basically waste less, get more right first time, it's all that sort of stuff, but then enable technology to actually um, enable us to get better at that from scheduling vehicles automatically to take kilometres off the road, maximising load fill, can all be done through systems. Uh, we will have 100% renewable electricity across the facilities by 2025. Um, and I guess the key learning we'd take is you've got to get started on the carbon reduction journey before you know all of the solutions uh, that you're going to go for. 2040 feels quite a long way away, but it also feels quite close. Um, and one of the things that we've started out uh, with, I'll come on to in a moment, is our transport solution. I would say when you go on that journey towards net zero, uh, you have to look at your whole systems. So things like the, the capital availability, uh, you can't be bound by traditional capital payback rules. Um, so actually JBS have set up a totally separate fund each year 
uh, which businesses um, dip into to look at purely projects that reduce uh, carbon across our estate. Um, and you have to focus just as hard on the incremental projects as well as the, the transformational ones. Uh, in the past four years, uh, the, 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 we had two sort of transport um, plans and, and interesting to hear about the thoughts on hydrogen earlier. Uh, we changed our fleet last year over to uh, liquid natural gas, uh, which is derived from anaerobic digestion. Uh, we changed all of our fleet uh, based in Lincolnshire over, uh, and that's uh, reducing our uh, carbon intensity by about 5,600 tonnes uh, per year. Um, and there was a lot of debate, is it the right thing to do? Is it the right technology? The fact is we turn these vehicles over every four years. So actually doing something now and then linking onto the back of the next technology as the infrastructure becomes available is the way that we're approaching this. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've uh, attacked our company car fleet, um, uh, again moving from a policy of uh, you know, uh, predominantly diesel vehicles through to uh, hybrids and fully electric, uh, currently now with a maximum uh, of, of 50 grams uh, per kilometre, uh, and that will move over to fully electric for more cars uh, ordered next year. But it's all very well doing the policy, you've got to have the infrastructure, so with that comes the investment in recharging facilities at our, all of our uh, locations. And that so far uh, in the last year has generated uh, 68 tonnes of savings. Um, in the, in the rest of the business, we've got uh, things like renewables within our farming estate. Uh, so a lot of the farms are heated by biomass, but actually in new farms, we're moving over to uh, ground source heating uh, and uh, solar and battery storage. Um, and just very briefly on labour supply, uh, with our employment, we, we've really suffered as many, much of the industry has on labour supply, and we've had to be inventive, uh, and we've had to think differently. Uh, we had to get better at what we do, and it's about listening. Uh, listening to the incumbent colleagues about what we need to do to make their work experience better. We have to be, as a baseline, competitive in terms of pay terms and conditions, but actually look at the rest of the industry. One of the things that we have moved to is become more agile in recruitment, direct recruitment, social media, uh, even working with supply partners in the fruit industry uh, and using accommodation options like much of uh, horticulture may use um, uh, as a way of attracting different pools of workforce to our business. Ultimately, uh, in terms of uh, labour, there isn't one single solution. Uh, you have to be an attractive and engaging proposition. And then when people join you, you have to give them a million reasons to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much for that, Jonathan. Hopefully today we're giving people in Greater Lincolnshire a million reasons to stay in Greater Lincolnshire. I hope, we're, I hope it's very inspirational. So we're nearly at the end of what's been an absolutely packed session, and I'm sure there's so much for everybody to digest, but we really need to take this opportunity to make what is a very exciting new announcement for our area. We're gathered in a unique location here, this building is the flagship venue for the Lincolnshire Agricultural Society and the showground is also home to the Bishop Burton Showground Campus, which trains over 500 students in their new purpose-built college site with a focus on precision agriculture. Across the road, we have seen the rapid progress, and it is rapid progress, the Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology has made since it was created in 2016 at Rise Home. This now has the largest agri-robotics team in Europe, a growing presence in digital food chain technology and teams working consistently on sustainability and land management. On the same site, we welcome the first Barclays Eagle Farm Lad Lab to spearhead national support for our SMEs and startups in the agritech sector, as well as seeing a growing number of agritech companies with specialisms in robotics, digital technologies, and in new crop sciences. These assets are supporting agriculture and they're sitting right here at the heart of the largest agricultural county in the UK. And we are now functioning as what is a really, really strong new cluster working tirelessly together. 
This is vital as the agricultural transition is changing how we support our farmers to deliver. It is vitally important that we equip this sector with new skills and the innovations needed for sustainable futures for all of us. So today, I am delighted to announce that our UK Food Valley has committed to jointly brand and promote this cluster north of Lincoln as the new Agricultural Growth Zone or Ag Zone. This collaborative development with partners at, get ready for this, the University, Bishop Burton, the Showground, Barclays Eagle Labs, West Lindsay District Council, Agricultural Society and Lincolnshire County Council, supported by our LEP, will all work together to attract new investors, new investment and knowledge-led growth for our farming industries. Complementing our highly successful existing food enterprise zones, the Ag Zone demonstrates the importance of supporting our growing clusters and the opportunities and success this focus can bring. And we've seen what focus can bring to the success of our area. The Ag Zone will provide a complete skills pipeline from interaction with schools through further education and undergraduate courses to postgraduate education and CPD. Now, over the coming months, we'll be announcing further investment in the Ag Zone, and our teams at the UK Food Valley and our LEP, working with other partners, are all welcoming conversations with anyone in this room who would like to work with us on the Ag Zone. We're determined here in Greater Lincolnshire to grow our agriculture and food sector. We want to bring huge opportunity to our area, highly skilled jobs, and we look forward to working with you all to deliver over the next coming year. I'd like to move over to some questions from the floor. I'm very conscious that we've given you a lot of information. We've had a lot of experts, and I've had a lot to read. A few questions from the floor. Have we got time, Pat? Are we allowed? OK. <laughs> Any questions, please? Hi, just a quick one from uh, Steph Wright from the Gusto Group. Steph. I was just wondering, in terms of the transition to uh, plant-based diets that's obviously taking place and a move away from uh, animal-derived proteins to, plant, to sort of healthier and more sustainable plant-derived proteins, what sort of, uh, sort of projections do you see in terms of the growth of that and, and how's that factoring into the investment? that's taking place. Yeah, would you like me to start on that? Um, so I think, Steph, that's a very good question. I think um, that's only going to continue to grow. We've seen that, and all the retailers are forecasting significant growth on those sort of products, and they're calling them healthy food products um, over the next coming five to ten years. So it's something that we really need to face into and to be able to deliver as an industry. Um, and I think that this is why we're seeing so much diversification actually in Greater Lincolnshire and we're seeing lots of our big businesses that maybe had one area of expertise in which they deliver a certain food product to like moving to two or three different areas of expertise within their business and we actually feel it's really important to support our businesses to deliver on that so that they can be sustainable and be here and ultimately fit for the future really. We don't just see businesses as doing one thing anymore. We see that we're going to have to be not only lean and efficient but we're going to have to be experts in other areas too and produce different types of foods. Would anyone else like to add to that? Uh, yeah, um, I, I guess the other thing is that plant protein is actually a, a relatively uh, immature market compared to a lot of the meat markets that have obviously developed over decades or indeed centuries. So actually we're seeing that, that actually businesses are investing in technology and innovation and growing, but actually the development is happening so quickly that uh, actually that's something that is going to continue to drive growth as innovation continues to step into that market. Yeah, just to add to that, I think one of the points to make is, um, particularly here in Lincolnshire, it's about quality. So I think we often polarise, you know, we've got organic, we've got conventional, we've got regenerative farming. And actually, you know, if you look around the county, you'll see a lot more livestock at the minute, a lot more sheep grazing cover crops going into regenerative systems. So I think that the point to make is 
that there's a, a very big journey coming within UK ag, but actually livestock in certain parts does have a really important place to play with rotations, with soil health, and I think the big thing and the big message for me is about quality. We've got to have you know, food that has got really good, uh, you know, it's nutrient dense, but it's good and high quality, and that's the single most important thing. And that, that goes for the feed going into the poultry sector. Everything has to be about quality in my mind. Thank you for that, Ben. Val? Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, across the university, we recognise this trend and we're building capacity and capability to, to support that um, with new investments in a, a fabulous analytical facility in the bridge and our own work at the National Centre for Food Manufacturing where we've recruited some new scientists and, and experts in this sort of, uh, this area really to be helped to, so we can move the agenda on and in new equipment and extrusion and other things so yeah fully recognize the importance and the need to invest in this thank you Val <laughs> one more question from the floor please um, hello Emma the business creative consultant across the county with all hi, sorts Emma. of folks hi my question is around I mean what an exciting place we are in at the moment the inward investment phenomenal so many eyes on us but how do we ensure that the investment coming in has some sort of commitment to social value around housing and infrastructure I know the Commonwealth Games anyone who was commissioned had to commit a percentage of that investment and was only commissioned because they put social value back as a return because we do have a housing shortage we do have a low birth rate you know we need people we need more infrastructure and more skills locally and the only way we're going to encourage young people to do that is is you know with extra housing and, and infrastructure yeah of course no thank you for that Emma if I can go go first on that one um, so completely agree with everything you've just said and actually that is absolutely at the heart what we do particularly at our LEP so when we sit around our board meetings we have representatives there from every single sector and what we don't do is we don't talk about I or me we talk about the we so okay if we're going to try and deliver something in the food sector what not only what impact will that have on other industries and other people but also, what do we need to do to excite people to want to be in that area? So it's not about one thing. Today, we've talked about some amazing things that are going on in our area and the huge opportunity. And the reality is we can't deliver on that without working on housing, without working with our schools. And genuinely, that's what it is all about, Emma. And I think actually moving on to the next conference, we can hopefully highlight and show some of the, the teamwork that we do as a LEP as well with each sector intertwined. Would you like to add anything, Ben? Yeah, I was just going to say, to add to that point, I mean, I uh, work very closely with a number of sort of farming and rural businesses, and many of those actually have quite a, you know, strong uh, housing stock, and, and getting them up to standard is, is, is a big challenge in the sector. Yes. Yeah. But what's really interesting are those businesses, and I could take you to, um, you know, a site at Ekring, where you've got some really forward-thinking innovation coming through into doing it differently and I think that's the opportunity uh, I've got a client at the minute where we're bringing you know a, a house forward that is going to have 150 plus sat rating that's going to be the highest in the country and that's not something that's big or anything like that it's just somebody who's set out to do it differently and and really challenge the norm and actually when you look at it on paper it will not be what ticks everybody's sort of box but from an innovation point of view, um, the ability to have very low energy going in and have something which is really cost effective, I think it's quite exciting. So I think there's lots of opportunities, but the biggest challenge is filtering down what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, uh, and, and I think it can be uh, done, at, done at all levels. And, and you know, if I think about uh, my organisation, little things like providing transport for workers, we could provide a private service, but actually we link up with Stagecoach to provide public services that are free of charge for anybody to use to actually provide transport in the region. Um, so, you know, OK, there are limited routes, but actually if more and more employers start to think about how they can link up and provide more social value, um, you know, there's little things that can be done can make a big difference in terms of getting cars off the road, providing transport at a lower cost to people as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think we sometimes have to, to stop and look at the word and top 10 global cluster. 
it's a really, that's top 10 in the world, it's a really big challenge, but clearly we're moving at a pace that makes that a, a realistic ambition, uh, and that, that's what makes this such a, an exciting time. We're not creating dreams that we can't deliver. These are real things that are happening, and they're happening at quite a pace. Uh, so thank you for that panel, really, really great stuff. Thanks to Sarah Louise for not just leading the panel, but leading the UK Food Initiative. Uh, it's a really important and, and, and uh, valuable sector to the area. Uh, time for a break now. Uh, refreshments are available uh, behind us. Uh, we're delighted to welcome back exhibitors this year. Um, a good number of them are our stakeholders and people we work with as partners. Uh, please go find out more about them and visit our own stands, uh, the LEP, Team Lincolnshire, Business Lincolnshire and the Careers Hub. Uh, and please use this, the QR codes. I don't know who's, how many are using it so far, but be interested to see how well they're used. We'll see you back here seated, please, by 11.20.